Now let's take things to a little bit of a deeper level in terms of the proton transfer step. A big question is, how do we know if or when a proton transfer step is favorable in the forward or reverse direction? As I mentioned in the last video, a PT step is very quick. This means that understanding the favorability of one side versus another is extremely important. The thermodynamics of the situation are really the only controlling factor, so we really need to know if or when a PT step is favorable. The way chemists think about this is to make the observation that neutral species tend to be fairly similar in energy. Because they're neutral, there's not a lot strongly destabilizing or strongly stabilizing them. They're just kind of there. As a result, it's the charged species in an acid-base equilibrium. And there will always be a charged species because we're transferring charge when we transfer H+. That really influences the position of the equilibrium. And as I note down here, equilibria favor the side with the more stable charged species. So looking for the more stable charged species will clue us in to the direction of the equilibrium. So for instance, going back to this example reaction that we saw in the last slide, here are the products of that reaction. And notice that we could run the reaction in reverse simply by giving a proton back like so. However, as you'll learn, this direction is not favored and the acid-base reaction proceeds primarily in the forward direction towards products. And it's because the anion on this side, the acetate anion, is more stable than the ethoxide anion. And you'll learn why very shortly. So in thinking about the stability of charged species, we really need to focus on the stability of cations, positively charged species, and anions, negatively charged species. Let's start with anions. Uh, it's useful to think about anions because many acid-base equilibria involve the transformation of a neutral acid, HA, into simply a dissociated H+, and A minus. And because H plus is fairly universal, it's differences in the A minus group that are really going to dictate differences in acidity. So that's why we want to think about the stability of anions when we talk about acidity and basicity. Stable anions are weak bases. That makes sense because they're low in energy and they don't really want to react. So if the equilibrium in terms of thermodynamics favors the right-hand side, in this case, then very little is going to happen going the other way in which A- is serving as a base and picking up a proton. So stable anions are weak bases and are bad at grabbing protons. What controls the stability of anions? Well, really, there are three factors involved. Delocalization, which is resonance delocalization that we've seen before. Hybridization, a concept we've seen before but haven't really dealt with in too much detail. And finally, solvent effects, which is something you may not have seen before, but that can have a profound and, I think, interesting effect on the stability of anions. So let's dive right in and attack these three stability factors. Resonance delocalization is the first one. And it stabilizes anions because it spreads negative charge out. So if we compare these acids, ethanol on the right, acetic acid on the left, we, we could see by looking at the charged species involved in each equilibrium, which in both cases is the anion or the conjugate base of the starting compound, we see there's no delocalization at all in the ethoxide anion. That negative charge is simply stuck on the oxygen atom. However, in the case of acetate, we do have delocalization available into the pi star orbital of the carbonyl. And we can represent that by a resonance structure that shifts the negative charge to the other oxygen. The result of that resonance structure would look like this. From that resonance structure, we can argue that this will be the stronger acid. The conjugate acid of the more stable anion will be the stronger acid because that equilibrium is more downhill. This equilibrium quite a bit less downhill and in fact I would predict uphill overall. 
As a result, this acid-base equilibrium is much more favorable towards the anion than the one on the right. Hybridization is an interesting factor in that it's something you've seen before but maybe not thought about in too much detail. One interesting observation about hybrid orbitals is that they have different electronegativities. So just like different atoms have different electronegativity, different hybrid orbitals do too. sp orbitals are the most electronegative, sp2 is in the middle, and sp3 are the least. And to explain this observation, chemists noted that, well, the nucleus is a positive entity, right, made of positively charged protons and neutral neutrons. As we add S character to the hybrid orbital, we actually pull it in closer to the nucleus. So an sp3 orbital might look like this, with quite a bit of electron density far from the nucleus. An sp2 would be slightly closer to the nucleus, and an sp3 would be the closest orbital to the, and excuse me, an sp would be the closest orbital to the nucleus, possessing the largest amount of S character. S character increases electronegativity, and this shows you why. Bringing electron density closer to the nucleus, as the sp orbital does, stabilizes the negative charge by placing it close to a positive charge. As a result of this stabilization, the conjugate acids of sp hybridized carbon hydrogen or, say, other nitrogen hydrogen bonds are more acidic stronger acids. So for instance, this terminal acetylene with its sp carbon hydrogen bond is a stronger acid than this molecule which has an sp2 carbon hydrogen bond. And again that's because the anion of that terminal acetylene is more stable than the anion of this vinyl compound which would place a negative charge in an sp2 orbital versus a more electronegative, more stabilizing sp orbital. And finally, solvation effects are the last effect that we'll look at in terms of the stability of anions. Interestingly, bulkier anions are found to be not as well solvated and more unstable than smaller ones. We can attribute this to the idea that solvents, particularly polar ones, will have positive regions. And these positive regions I'll just label with little positive charges, have the potential to get close to the negative charge and stabilize it. Now in the case of bulky anions, such as the tert butyl anion, the large methyl groups on the outside of the anion shield the negative charge from receiving this benefit of positive charges from the solvent. It's very difficult for those charges to get in close to the tert butyl anion. For an anion like this, it's a little bit easier because we're lacking one of those bulky methyl groups, but it is still fairly hard, especially for positive charges coming from this side. Getting rid of both of those methyl groups and going all the way down to the methyl anion, we have the most stable of them all because this anion doesn't have any methyl groups blocking the negative charge, and that negative charge can be stabilized very easily by very close positive charges from the solvent.